I'm Natalie Baldwin of Wayfinder Beer, and this is the Brewer to Brewer podcast from All About Beer. My guest is Kat Wiest of Yakima Chief Hops, and she is here for a conversation that goes beyond the brew house and into topics that matter to brewing professionals and curious beer drinkers. Please visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media to support journalism in the beer space and check out patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We'll get into the conversation in just a moment, but first, this message. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. Discover the advantage of using new and unique ingredients like lemon myrtle or lapsang shushan. First Tea has been working with brewers to introduce distinctive, high-quality botanicals for innovative craft beers. They focus on being direct, flexible, and fast. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firstea.com. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. A bit about my guest today. Kat Weiss quit her nightclub security job to begin brewing in 2012 after answering a Craigslist ad. A decade later, with experiences ranging from large-scale production to small pub brewing and positions from graveyard gremlin to head brewer, she has settled in at Yakima Chief Hops as copywriting manager. Thanks to scholarship opportunities from the Pink Boots Society, the Glenn Hay Falconer Foundation, she can proudly list UC Davis, the Siebel Institute of Chicago, and the World Brewing Academy in Munich on her resume. She has served on the Pink Boots Society Board of Directors and is grateful for all opportunities she has had to learn and grow with the organization. She supports labor rights and is an advocate for equity and safety in the beer industry. Kat describes herself as a lifelong beach bum, an admirer of sharks, and a friend to all seagulls. She enjoys swimming in the ocean, bowling, and bird watching. <laughs> Favorite beers include leaders of traditional Bavarian Helles or snifters of Russian Imperial Stout, but she's a ride or die lover of West Coast IPA. She, sorry, my cats are fighting. <laughs> She lives on the Oregon coast with her husband and their two mischievous cats. Uh, so I guess that was a perfect timing for that. Um, they were just behind the screen hitting each other in the face. So, hey, Kat. <laughs> oh, hey, I thought you were just uh, laughing at my love of IPA because I know you're the lager lady. <laughs> nah, West Coast IPAs are the shit. <laughs> All right. So I'm super excited to chat with you today because we've known each other for quite a while at this point. I think we're pushing about eight years or so, maybe a little bit less than that, seven years. I was thinking remember? about that today. I was like 2016-ish, because I feel yeah. like 2015 to 2018 was like, uh, I, I don't know what happened. It, that's all. <laughs> that was all one year. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, but I kind of wanted to hear a little bit of what you remember about us first meeting, and then I'll probably just like chime in and chat along with it just because I'm excited to hear what you, what you remember. Well, I like to tell people that we met on the internet. We did. Uh, or like, I'll be like, oh, we met on Facebook, <laughs> uh, which is basically true. Um, at the time I was the head brewer at Seabright Brewing in Santa Cruz. And by head brewer, I was like the only brewer. I did all the things, um, you know, with total free reign, uh, which is awesome. There's a lot of pros to working in a tiny place with no help <laughs> is that you can just kind of do whatever you want. So um, I was making glitter beer and trying to find ways to make it uh, extra cool. And a woman came in and was so excited about it. Whenever people get excited about glitter beer, I'm just like, yeah, you're my people. Like, let's <laughs> talk. So I came out from the brew house to chat with this lady. Uh, you know, I, I think I poured her some tank samples and was like, oh, yeah. And I'm, this is a blend. Like, it may look like one glitter, but I did all these things. And she was super stoked about it. And was like, do you know Natalie Baldwin? And I was like, no, but I know of her. Because it was that time. Like, again, it was in that weird blur of years. It feels like one year. There were a lot of articles being written 
about uh, women working in breweries. And there was, Mm -hmm. I don't remember the publication, maybe it was like Thrillist. It was like 10 women breaking Glear's Beer's glass ceiling. Um, And you were featured in that. Uh, I was featured in that. And I feel like we kind of met through being featured in these like listed articles of ladies. So I was like, oh yeah, no, I know of her. She sounds so cool. So she introduced us on (laughs) Facebook. Uh, And then we like chatted a little bit. And um, I'm a longtime supporter of Bitch Media, RIP. And their, was it their 20th? Yeah, it was their 20th anniversary. It was going to be in Portland. Uh, And so I sent you a Facebook message and I was like, I'm coming to the bitch party. <laughs> you want to, you want to come to the party with me? And you were like, I not only want to go to the party with you, I think you should brew a beer with me. And I, 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 we designed a recipe and I, I packed 11 pounds of uh, lemon drop hop pellets in my suitcase. Oh yeah. Lemon drop. I forgot that. Part. Yeah. That was like a really sexy hop at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, I heard great things about that beer. I never got to try it. So yeah, I, it was <laughs> my bad. We brewed together meme. in Portland. And I, I remember walking into the brewery and it was so cold and you were like, yeah, let's go to the cooler to get hops. And I was like, I can't even handle the cooler right now. And it was warmer <laughs> in the cooler. And I just thought I could never do this. This is insane. Like it's warmer in the cooler. This, this is too <laughs> extreme, like can't handle it. And then there was like an ice storm. It was very crazy. Yeah, it was, you randomly came to Portland when there was a, one of our ice storms. And I remember much I, today, you can't see Kat, but she's wearing cute little um, phones that have cat ears on them. And I remember you also had earmuffs with little cat ears. And it's I was true, like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we made this beer that was based around, um, what was the cocktail? Because was it- it was a sidecar. Oh yeah. It was a sidecar. Cause that was like a super popular cocktail that was, um, or it was super popular around the time when, uh, the 19th amendment was passed. Right. Yeah. It was Is like that- a pre prohibition or it enjoyed its heyday. Yeah. Now I can't remember, but I, yeah, it was, we had a 19th amendment based yeah. theme. So we, um, just made like a little beer and then added some orange soaked or we soaked orange zest in cognac. It's yeah. obviously been long enough that the pieces are a little bit blurry, but I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just, and I, I, think I remember it's funny to think about that. We went to that party and then afterwards, uh, you took me to Reverend Nat's yep. to have cider and it was my, we and I was just like, man, I don't like cider. And we went into the bar and I looked at the menu and I was about to say, do you have any beer? But I was a a small pub brewer with eight tap handles or nine tap handles. And sometimes people would say, do you have any cider? And it like, man, it would really grind my gears. I'm like, this is a brewery. We don't make cider. So I tried to like kind of take a page from my own irritation. And instead of asking for a beer, I asked the bartender who now like years later, I'm also friends with. Oh yeah, Uh, Yeah. I was like, Hey, I don't, I don't really like cider, but here's the kind of beer that I like. And she was stoked. She was like, I'm going to be your cider Sherpa and I'm going to find something that you love. And she did. Yeah. I think that might've been like one of two times I'd ever actually been to that that cider place because it's in the Lloyd center and I'm just never really over there, but, uh, yeah, just kind of a funny random place that I brought you. Um, and now here we are both in Oregon. Yeah. Almost uh, a decade later. How did you get here? You, um, were kind of like wanting to live on the coast is I can't remember like the Oregon, like you worked, you moved up here for a job, but you just wanted to work on the coast and live near, cause you're just a water person. You like swimming in the water and you've done I like have, triathlons and stuff. I've done a horrible job at, um, pigeonholing myself into a very limited geographic location in which I can reside. <laughs> uh, I grew up, I grew, like grew up on the beach, like Uh, when my mom was pregnant with me, like all those photos that you take of like the bump, they were all of like my mom on the beach in a bikini holding up a sign, like how many months along she was. I (laughs) am a total beach baby. And uh, I've, there are all like all beaches are great, but I love the Pacific ocean. So 
kind of like, well, that's my blood and I'll die without it. I loved Santa Cruz. Um, very much like the Bay Area is kind of like that will always be my home. That's my heart. But even growing up there and just kind of adjusting to the cost of life, like it never seemed expensive. It's the only thing, you know, it's just like, oh, mm-hmm. this is how it is. But it, like every year, my husband and I would be like, maybe in five years we could buy a house. And then another year would go by and we'd save money and we'd be like, maybe in another five years. And it just kept becoming more and more completely unrealistic. It was like, well, we got to get out of here. Like, what are we going to do? And I made a short list. Uh, he's a merchant mariner. So kind of putting port towns in, I was like, well, I love Long Beach. Um love San Diego. So like those were, those were up there. And then like somehow randomly the Oregon coast became mm-hmm. like the other part. I had a friend in Astoria and she was like, you should come move up here. And like, I don't know, there's not much out there. Uh, but yeah, out of all the, all the places I ended up on the Oregon coast, uh, no regrets though. It's pretty good. And we finally got to, you know, buy a damn house. So, so it was awesome. not a bad move. Yeah. We'll definitely talk about lots of beery stuff, but I want people to know about all the other like really cool, interesting parts of your personality and interests and things like that. And um, again, a lot of it is based around water. So you, how often do you swim in the Neetarts Bay? You no wetsuit, just your bathing suit in the, in the cold. Some, what is it like? Sometimes two degree water. Sometimes less than a bathing suit. Um <laughs> I've got some pretty, I've got a pretty good record of midnight skinny dips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I went yesterday and the water was three degrees warmer than it has been all year. It was a balmy 51. Hoo-hoo. Hoo-hoo. Yeah. Nice and clear. I, tr- I try to go twice a week, but sometimes it's just once a week and sometimes it's three times one week and then not really any time the next week. Um, but yeah, it's nice. It's a good, it's a good reset. It's cold. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's hard to get, it's hard to get in. Most of the time it's pretty hard to get in, but then once you're in, it's great. And I never get out of the water feeling like what a waste of time. Yeah. You know, I I've really gotten into bird watching and yesterday I saw like, it's fun to be in the Bay. And I went, it was like seven o'clock to seven 30. So it was like a nice, good sunset swim. Saw five Eagles, Wow. Uh, three, ju- three, no, three adults and two juveniles saw a couple of blue herons. There's sometimes there's a kingfisher that like, Ooh. you know, dives around. So that's really fun. Um, last year I started like stalking our resident peregrine falcons. I named them, uh, Fritz and Francis. So <laughs> I, I go back and I look for them cause they should be back now. And I thought I saw one at the post office a couple weeks ago. So I think they're back. The seabirds are going to start nesting. So yeah, I just, I spend a lot of time on the beach. I try to go every day. Uh, I at least will walk to the end of the street to watch the sunset. If it's raining, I might not. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But we live in a really cool strip. Like if I go out my front door, the ocean's a five minute walk. And if I go out my back door, like the woods are stumbling distance. So depending on, you know, kind of what I'm into, like right now the bears are kind of coming out with cubs. So I haven't spent too much time going out the back door, but yeah, I love traveling. I'll go anywhere, especially if it has a beach. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then, um, before working in beer, you did a couple things, but mainly in the summers you traveled North to Alaska and did, um, salmon fishing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was a, a gill netter, uh, since 2007, I was going up there for the summers, uh, set netting in the, in Kisilov and the cooking, primarily drift boat fishing in Bristol Bay. And, uh, I spent a couple crazy winters herring fishing in San Francisco. So that's like, a, yeah, I'm, I, I have, I officially retired from fishing, uh, this last year. So that was, that was pretty rough. It's, I don't know. I officially retired a couple of years ago. I think I've officially retired twice. So maybe you I snuck a, a last one in, which I, I, think... I snuck in like, you know, one yeah. more set. So yeah, that could have been it, but I have to leave it open. I left some gear up there just in case. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting when, you know, through our whole careers as women in the beer industry, people are always asking what it's like to be a woman in the beer industry. And 
I think it's so interesting that you've worked in so many different facets, but it's really cool that you've been in labor jobs as like one of very few women. And it's, uh, I just think you're a badass was the, the main point of that. But, um, well, the first yeah. time I went up to Alaska, I didn't have a job and I didn't know, really know anybody. And you, there's like this, um, this is in Naknek and there's an area where, you know, guys just put signs on a bulletin board that say like, I'm 26 and I'm six foot two and I weigh 185 pounds. It's like, <laughs> I remember saying like, all right, well, I'll just post my bra size because <laughs> <laughs> that's about as relevant as all that other shit. Like, yep. It's it, can you make good decisions when you haven't slept for 36 hours? That's the only thing I care about. Yep. And, uh, how do you look covered in blood guts and fish totally. scales, you know, I tell you that's like the secret to good skin, a good complexion, nice, beautiful <laughs> skin. <laughs> um, so after you or your first job in the beer industry was at a pretty big brewery, it was at the Berkeley pyramid, which was 125 barrel brew house. And that was like a pretty crazy experience as a, a first job, I imagine, especially because while you were there, the um, company unionized. And um, that just, I don't really know many other brewers have it, who have experienced that. And then after you left there, you went to Speakeasy, which was it, it's kind of like basically 50 barrel brew house, but it's 20 and 30 it was barrel a brew houses separate. It was a 20, it was a 20. And then while I was up brewing on the 20, they were installing a side-by-side -side 30. So it was a 60, but in uh, two 30 barrel batches, it was like a seven vessel brew house. Whoa. Yeah. I'm like, that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it was not, and it was not automated. I'm like, no, you got to automate that. But yeah, I, I never had to work on the seven vessel setup. Um. Yeah, seems crazy. And then after there, uh, you basically went over to Seabright, which was, I can't remember. So you said seven barrel. Now I got to think about it. Was it a seven? I might I have just like made it, that up. I think you're right. I'm like, no, that was like a 10 or a 15. But I think my fermenters were 15. Yeah, my fermenters were 15s and I was just turning out doubles. Nice. Um, I'm curious about, obviously those are like huge scale difference. Was there anything that you find like particularly charming about large breweries and small breweries? I, I think that um, we all hear these like really intense horror stories about these, you know, big breweries or small breweries, just all these different things. I just want to know what you liked about both of those different scales. I think that brewing is an intense horror story just by <laughs> itself. Like <laughs> that can just... Like, well, we just, we could just say like, yeah, no matter what you're doing, home brewing could be an intense horror story. Uh, I like, I like large scale production and then it's tough. Like most people, I feel like most brewers like start out small and then like work into it a different way. I got hired like literally off Craigslist and then thrown into this massive production facility, uh, which was terrifying because I didn't know anything. Like, I didn't know how valves worked. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds really stupid and I should be embarrassed to admit that, but you don't know something until you learn it. I don't and think that sounds stupid. Like when just, <laughs> I started brewing, I didn't know about like plumbing and electricity and all those types of things, let alone valves. So it's like, like you're saying, you're totally. jumping into this whole new environment. So I learned like process flow and like the fluid dynamics of, of CIP on a very, very large scale, which kind of made it easier to draw. Like I didn't understand anything. So I would draw the, like I would draw the filter and, um, you know, all, all the, all the plumbing and the valves and the tanks and just to get a better idea of how things were going on in a smaller brewery. That's really hard because it's really just like a hose burrito on the floor that you're <laughs> like dragging a pump from one place to another. So I feel like larger production facilities have a greater semblance of order. Uh, and I also like how layered things are like their time doesn't, it's not linear. If you're knocking out and you're boiling and you're in mash rest and you're milling, you know, and you've got a fermenter CIP running for the next thing. And like, 
you know, yeast is getting ready to, to pitch. That's like seven. There's just so much stuff that you have to kind of layer and keep, uh, you, you have to keep the timing right. So for me personally, how I operate, if I'm doing multiple things, I can be more successful than if I'm just doing one, I'll be like, I just got to do this one thing. No problem. And I might not really do a very good job, but if I know that, I, but if I know that I don't have a second to drop the ball, it kind of makes me a little bit sharper. Um, but it's also horribly exhausting and we were very understaffed there. And that's actually why we unionized, mm-hmm. uh, little breweries. I think there's, um, I think they're more unsafe. Uh, there's a, a bit point. more of like a, a cowboy mentality. Um, just kind of like, oh, well, this is, this is how it's done. We we're, we're little, we've got to, we've got to really fight this. This is heavy. I should get help lifting this, but I don't have time. Um, you know, hand railing, you know, this. some, we have a friend that calls me OSHA eyes. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm safety officer cat. If I see something, I'm just kind of like, ah, no, that's not safe. You shouldn't be doing that. But in a small brewery, it's like you do it or you go home. I hear your voice in my head whenever, like, I don't ever crawl in vessels, but I remember <laughs> no. you always say, uh, or the voice I have in my head is, if you have to get inside to clean it, something's you're doing something wrong. Yeah. If you um, have to get inside a tank to clean it, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Like a kettle or whatever. If you have to like scrub something extra, yeah. Dial in your chemicals, uh, pay attention to something else, get a new spray ball, whatever it is. I, yes. Um, I always hear that in my head. <laughs> so thanks for that. Keeping me safe. You're welcome. I'm that makes me really happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't have a favorite between big or small. Uh, you know, I just, I want, um, I just want everybody to like be safe at work and remember that whatever you're earning as whatever your wages as a brewer, it's not worth getting like your arm mangled or caustic sprayed in your face. So, you know, protect yourself. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to advocate for those situations when you are in smaller breweries, because you know that finances, um, impact, you know, sometimes you just don't have enough money to do something and right. take risks that are unnecessary and you don't have to do that. And, and there's a line of people that want your job. I can't tell you how many times at Seabright I had some, uh, people come in and say, I'd really love to work here. And I'd say, you know, I'm not, we're not hiring. I, I, I can't have, there, I have no assistant. Like I have, yeah. I have no job. Um, they'd say, Oh, I'll do anything. I'll work for free. And I'm like, man, don't work for free. I don't work for free. Why would anybody do that? But it kind of, it cheapens our labor. If there's a, if there's a, if there's a line of folks that'll just come in and say, oh no, I'll just do that for free. Like don't work for free and breweries out there. Don't ever take an unpaid intern. That's, that's unethical. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first started brewing, like you said, I, that was what I thought that you had to do. And I thankfully had people that told me that just as you're, you are, you know, advocate for yourself and don't work for free because people will do that. But, um, tell me a little bit about Seabright. I think it has like a kind of a a cute little history because they were like one of the first breweries to win a JBF medal, right? Oh yeah. Oh my God. So many, they were, um, so they're part of the class of 88 in California. I want to say that it was like there, it was one of the first five brew pubs in the state of California cool. and the owners, uh, it's, it's changed ownership, but I'm not sure of the details. I honestly haven't been back for, so I haven't even visited Santa Cruz for years. Um, so it's kind of changed a little bit, but the original owners who I worked for, one of them was super into paragliding and the other one was super into home brewing. And they were like, let's, open a brewery so that <laughs> I can make beer and you can just go paragliding all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, uh, that's how it was, I guess. I mean, those Funny. are the stories. Yeah. Funny. And I remember looking back at the, when you told me it was like, they had won a bunch of GABF medals from the beginning of the competition. And I looked back totally. through and it was just kind of a, a cool spot in beer history. I found uh, Charlie's original brew log from 1986. So it was like when he first started home brewing and a lot of like, so all those original recipes 
It was like two rows seamalt and chinook. <laughs> two yeah. rows seamalt, chinook. Columbus, or centennial <laughs> i'm just kind of yeah. like oh cool cool and i brought a few of them back i was like you know what we're just gonna go straight back to like this recipe from 1986 and they you know they did what you know with modern technology and techniques and they were they were really popular i mean i i liked him yeah funny i don't think i really know that much about what type of beers you like to make because um when we first met we didn't live in the same place so i didn't really know what kind of beers you like to brew oh i like to make weird stuff uh at seabright i did some weird things but i love to design like my favorite recipe to write is for a red ale and i've really never uh, what was the one i did make one at seabright I, now i can't remember what it was called and that is a crying shame uh, because there's not a commercially available red ale that is the red ale of my dreams. <laughs> I want something that's like six and a half percent, but I want it to finish at like two Play-Doh. Like I don't <laughs> like that hall. It's red. It can finish a little bit higher. I want it super attenuated um, and hoppy. But with like that classic bitterness, like like CTZ kind of bitterness, like dry mm -hmm. hop with Columbus maybe kind of bitterness. And I want a little bit of chuck. I'm just going to give, this is my dream recipe. Somebody make it uh, a little bit of chocolate malt for that, like center of the Tootsie Pop. And I don't like heavy sea malt flavors. Like I don't want too much caramel. So I really enjoy red X. And I think great Western has that steam malt mm -hmm. it's not supposed to impart too much caramel flavor, but you still get like the crystallized red uh, colors. And now I, now I want a red ale. I'm drinking this brown from Cloudburst. It's actually fantastic. Nice. Uh, it's called it's called not interested. <laughs> and you know what? I am. I am interested. This is tasty. Steve Luke, what a guy. Another unpopular style. He gets it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about? I mean, you've received these pretty big scholarships and have had access to really cool educational opportunities. Um, I guess bigger picture, like I think sometimes it's really intimidating for folks to write applications or fill out applications for scholarships and write the letters. And it feels like pretty far-fetched to get one of these big scholarships. Like how did you feel writing those applications and do you have any like advice for people when you're in that situation and kind of, do you feel like that work was benefited by what you received gaining those scholarships? Oh, definitely. I, I felt like every application essay that I ever wrote was a winner. Mm -hmm. I really did. But also I probably wrote like 30 application essays over the course of 10 years and, you know, received two of those scholarships. So what I understand is from both of the organizations that I was a recipient from is that most people, you know, apply and apply again. Um, it's unlikely that a first round writer, I mean, earlier in my career, like, the Falconer scholarship I applied for in 2012 when I first started brewing, that education would have been, I'm not going to say lost on me because it's so valuable, but to go through everything that I went through in the beer industry and to have the understanding and the foundation that I had when I did eventually uh, go through that entire program, it just meant so much more. It meant light years more because I was kind of already a place where it was sort of stagnant. Like in the beginning when you're learning things, the curve is it's just infinite growth and then there's sort of a plateau so i feel like i was at the plateau um you know for that for the siebel world, world brewing academy program um if there are folks that are looking at scholarship opportunities one if you're not you should be looking at scholarship opportunities because mm -hmm. there's so much there's so much out there uh find an organization that you or you know a school that you want to go to and then just kind of research um what's out there and then, you know, apply. Most folks want uh, letters of recommendation. So kind of, you know, I think that it, I think that it's important to choose where your letters come from to have the greatest impact, but don't be discouraged. If you don't get it, just apply again next year or for the next scholarship the next month. 
yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Um, and when you were able to travel to Germany for the second half of your Glenn Hay Falconer scholarship, can you tell me a little bit about that? Just because it was a weird time in the world because <laughs> you received the scholarship. Were you, you were in Chicago in 2020, correct? Or yeah. did it all get delayed? Oh, no. So I received that scholarship in 2019 or it was spring. It was either 2019 to start in the fall of 2019. I think that was it because I was supposed to be in the start in the fall, uh, in Chicago. So it's a, it's a dual campus course. It's, um, it starts in Chicago at the Siebel Institute, and then it wraps in Munich at the World Brewing Academy or, you know, great, grateful thing. But the campus in, in Chicago was being rebuilt and relocated, and it just wasn't ready yet. So I was bummed. I remember I was sitting in a tap room drinking a beer, and I got the email that said my course was being bumped to spring, and I was just like, it, you know how a minor inconvenience can just feel life shattering, which I think was most of 2020 for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, that was so that kind of started a little early for me when my course got bumped back. So I started in Chicago in February 2020. And like my mom's a public health nurse. So she sent me she was like, you're going to wear this mask at the airport. You're going to do all these things. You're not going to you're going to wear a hermetic suit. And I'm just like, whatever, mom, I always wash my hands when I use trans, like, come on, I'm not like a, a total garbage monster. So, uh, things were going great. Chicago was great. The seal course in Chicago is, is hands down. Great. I mean, I learned, I, I think actually I reference it often. These are, these, these are all my notes from, oh, wow. Chicago. just from Chicago. This is like 600 pages of very large graph paper. Anyway, I'm an avid note taker. Same. So because I live in this super remote area where there's no, there's a lot of cool stuff to do. It's all based in nature. There's no like good food or music or culture. I <laughs> was very dedicated to doing great at school, but I was, I also really wanted to go out every night and go see shows and eat music, eat music, eat new foods <laughs> and, uh, go to hockey games. It was hockey season. So I was going to like a hockey game every week, maybe like two shows every week, and then pretty much going out every night. And then, you know, like COVID really happened. And then our school shut down. Uh, yeah, I was at like a hockey, I was actually at a hockey game when they were like, all domestic flights have been grounded or no more international flights. I was just like, this is crazy. Is this like, what? can we finish this hockey game? Like, are we going to get sent home at intermission? The sharks were winning and then they ended <laughs> up. Uh, so yeah, that was really, um, stressful. Like everybody had a stressful spring. Yeah. There's no, but there's was, nothing unique there, but it was a weird um, learning experience. Cause you had the courses separated pretty far apart. Right. Yes. I do think that I actually benefited from that a little bit. If we had rolled from Chicago straight over to Germany as planned, um, I don't think I would have been forced to revisit some of the harder topics that we covered in Chicago. Mm. So basically I got sent home and then we're like, all right, we're going to reconvene in Germany in the fall. And we did, thank God. But uh, before going, I just kind of went back to, I, I always wrote down the study questions and like, I kept copies of the quiz questions and I sort of like retested myself on all that stuff before going to Germany, uh, because it was incredibly important to me. You know, somebody else was paying for that education and I didn't want to just pass. I wanted to blow it out of the water. Uh, I wanted to get an A plus, um, which I did, but I, yeah. I just, I wanted to do like the best. I didn't just want to show up and do it. I wanted to be like really good at it. So, uh, yeah, I think being that's in Germany how you was always great. Are. Like that. Thank you. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like I'm not doing the best. Um, but you know, I, I feel more beholden to the expectations of other people, you know, these scholarships, um, the foundations and organizations, always ask um in your application essay like are you going to help further the goals like how are you going to sort of pay forward in the community 
uh, what you learned. So I take that, I take that very seriously when I, the things that I write in my essay of like my goals and, and what I want to do, that's not, I'm not just saying those things so that you give me the scholarship. I mm-hmm. like, it's very genuine. Yeah. I think that that's a, a really big part of who you are in the beer community too. And, you know, giving back to the Pink Boot Society working on the, the board, like that's an unpaid, completely volunteer, very time intensive uh, commitment. So I think that you have contributed much, much more than I'm sure you actually realize because I, I know how, how hard and, and draining that can be. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Cause you're, uh, you're a leader now for Portland pink boots, which is how Try you know be. how hard and draining it can be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we go on to the next topic, We're just going to do a little brief pause and come right back. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. Discover the advantage of using new and unique ingredients like lemon myrtle or lapsang shushan. First Tea has been working with brewers to introduce distinctive, high-quality botanicals for innovative craft beers. They focus on being direct, flexible, and fast. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.f-i-r-s-d-t-e-a.com. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. All right. So we got a pretty good background about who you are and where you've been in the beer industry. But something that I think is really important, and people have been going through a lot around the pandemic, sort of like pushing it, but also kind of like where we are in our careers, you know, you have worked your way through a brewery all the way to lead and management positions. And, um, you know, your job opportunities are a little bit more scarce after that, right? Like you don't want to make lateral moves, you want to make big moves, or maybe you do want to make lateral moves, whatever the decision is. But I think something that is really hard with the beer industry is that there's this like cool guy vibe that comes with being a brewer, you get like interviewed, you're on podcasts, the public sort of know who you are. And like, there's this big piece of our identity that gets tied to our jobs as brewers. And I know that you've been through a lot in the last year, um, leaving a brewing job and transitioning to a job that isn't directly making beer, but impacts our industry really intensely. But I think I just want to start a conversation about you know, how you feel about identity and who you are as a person and how that connects to your role in the industry. And, you know, big picture, we're tying this into your new job at YCH. So if you want to start with like talking about what your role is at YCH, and then we can like deep dive into feels or whatever you want to do, I can re-ask questions too. So um, you feel like we're headed in a direction, but that's kind of like what I want to talk about. So um, I started at Yakima Chief Hops three months ago, just about three months ago. Uh, I'm the copywriting manager, which I realize now when I say that some people have misinterpreted that thinking that I do legal work um, protecting our copyrights, uh, which is not the case. Ooh, I, yeah, I know. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, that's, that is definitely not me. Uh, it's writing the copy um, for external facing things that... Uh, you know, if you get a customer email or read our blogs, um, see press releases, it'll, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Uh, it felt too good to be true. Honestly, just like my work through with Pink Boot Society, there was a lot of tangential work with Yakima Chief Hops, putting together the blend, promoting Mm -hmm. the blend. Uh, and I kind of always wanted to work for them because everyone there is like stoked and they don't leave. Mm -hmm. which is a key thing to look for Uh, places with low turnover might be like really good work environments. So uh, 
this opportunity came up and they were willing for it to be remote, which is huge for me. Like I said, I've really pigeonholed myself into uh, a limited geographic location. So it does seem kind of weird. Uh, actually, I was at I was at Cloudburst a couple of weeks ago and I mentioned something to Steve, like I'm a copywriter, copywriter now. And he's like, you went from brewing to copywriting? I'm like, I guess it's, I guess it sounds weird. I was a journalism student um, in San Francisco and a horticulture student in Santa Cruz. And I wrote for fishing magazines uh, throughout my career as a fisherman. So to me, it's not weird. I'm just like, oh, this is perfect. This is like an amalgamation of all the things. Um, so yeah, so that's my role now, which I'm, which I'm still kind of getting my legs under me. I'm, I'm pretty new. I've got a lot of awesome support, which is, um, almost alarming, you know, I'm just like, oh, thank you for all your help. Uh, well, they you really want supportive. you there, you know, like, like you said, they sort of adapted the role so that it could be a mobile position. And I think, like you said, it shows a really big, a really great sign of a, of a good company that people want you there. They want to support you. They give you resources and support in any way you need. And that's so cool. Yeah. And Anyway, they say nice things. It's just right now it's we, all, it's just like, we like all them. rainbows and we, we like them. Uh, so yeah, stoked on the transition in terms of like identity and kind of what my identity is as a brewer. It's tough. Like I feel identity is complicated. Like I'm a kaleidoscope. I'm not like, I, you know, just like shake it a little bit and then the picture and now it's something different. Um, and then maybe if you shake it again, it'll go back to that, that first picture. So it's, uh, just a lot. Of, I feel like I'm just a lot of different like colors and shapes that sometimes make something cool and other times just look like a mistake, <laughs> but leaving brewing was not hard for me. Um, I was, I was looking for opportunities to do less physical work. Um, I now have arthritis in my knees. Yay. And like, most brewers know, you know, your back hurts all the time and you never get to sit down. And I was really tired of coming home from work and feeling physically drained, so physically drained that I couldn't do the physical things that make me happy. Like my husband will say, Hey, let's go for a hike. And I'm just like, I need to lay down and with my legs up because my knee is so swollen or I don't have the mental energy for a creative project that would, you know, bring me some happiness that used to be a hobby because I'm just like zonked. I just want to sit on the couch and watch like four episodes of something on Netflix and then go to sleep and start over because the hours are long and kind of unforgiving at times. Um, I don't think that that like, what identity that I do have as a brewer could be sort of stripped by not being in that position just because of the work that I've done through my time working in brew houses, like uh, the union efforts at Pyramid and, you know, learning everything that I learned about labor rights. And I've kind of carried that with me and um, always try to help educate people. And if they're in a bad situation, there's a lot of a lot of uh, low wage employees being exploited in this country, um, trying to encourage others to kind of stand up for yourself and, you know, ask for equal pay, like, you know, have the tough conversations. And if you don't want to have the tough conversation, that's fine because, you know, uh, calling them tough is an understatement. So I, I feel like I have like kind of done my part and the wart production doesn't, it doesn't even count. You know, I, I'm more proud of the other things that I've done as, as a brewer than mm -hmm. the beer production itself. Oh, I like sense. that a lot. I, I feel like that was a rant. <laughs> no, that wasn't a rant that I like all that perspective and yeah, you know, when you're, I don't know, there's just like something about how peers, there's just like the hard, the school of hard knocks, right? Like yeah. How hard can you work? How many kegs can you clean? All, all of these things, how much beer did you make that, you know, kind of happen along the way. But I really like that you talked about that the ways that you've impacted the beer industry 
isn't just about like making a beer, right? Like it's not yeah. a specific recipe or making a beer or being at a place. It's sort of how you've contributed to the whole industry. And I, I did think about leaving the beer industry completely. Um, you know, ideally I was looking for something that I could do remotely and not relocate. Uh, and just as, as a point, I'm very privileged in my ability to select those things. I am married. My partner has a good job and supports me in the decisions that I make. So I wasn't in a position where it was like, I need a job. I have mm -hmm. to get, I have to just take a job. I was able to be very selective, um, about whatever position that I took. So if it was going to be in the beer industry, I really needed it to be bright and shiny and like it really had to check all the boxes. So I thought I'm just going to have to do something else. I got my, um, I got my merchant mariner credentials last year. I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be a sailor. You know, they're <laughs> short on sailors right now. I could probably move up pretty fast. And the sadness that I felt while entertaining the idea of like ripping the bandaid on beer completely, it was more in terms of what I have felt as a personal obligation towards, you know, like, oh, I, I haven't done enough to repay the Falconer Foundation. I haven't mm. done enough to uh, continue like assisting other women in the Pink Boot Society. Like if I leave now, I was a waste of an investment. You know, that's not true, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so that was my, that was the, that was the biggest sadness for me. It was just kind of like, oh, well, that's, man, you worked really hard. You did a lot of stuff there. Like, I don't know. I just turned my back on that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think if you left the beer industry fully, that that would be you turning your back, but I, I totally hear what you say. And I think that's part of that identity, right? Like you are constantly absorbing all this information, especially when you have an employer or an organization or something that's supporting you and, you know, offering you all these access to resources. And if you walk away, what does that mean? And yeah. Did you have any conversations this? You don't have to have answer to this question, but like, did you have any conversations with people around like what that felt like? And when you were thinking about leaving the industry and. Uh, yeah, not, not specifically. Like I didn't say, Oh, I feel like I'm a waste of an investment, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I made sure to, I reached out to a lot of folks and I was just like, I'm not working right now. Uh, I don't know what opportunities there are for me, but I want to be very intentional and I don't want to relocate. Like, what do you think? Can I come hang out sometime? And, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of folks were just super receptive and, uh, you know, would send me job postings or, um, offer a little bit of, I mean, I'm not going to maybe counseling makes it sound like. I was taking advantage of people's emotional labor, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, I, I, I was, I did reach out to a lot of folks to make sure that I was kind of covering all my bases and not like selling myself short. And just the amount of support that I got, um, was kind of like, well, this is pretty cool. Like, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to leave this. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. And now that you're transitioning towards being like fixated on hops because that's your job um oh, yeah. when you started at YCH you had some like pretty cool onboarding and like sensory training right yeah um the sensory lab at YCH is man they've got all the toys <laughs> it's very <laughs> very cool I love it I was there um a couple years ago uh to pack help package up the pink boots supply remember we did because we had to do the, the little package actually yeah, yeah i helped pack all those boxes and a bunch of the um regional sales people were all in yakima for something and they just invited me to be part of their sensory training so everybody gets a little ipad and then we sit down and it was like we did hop evaluations and we did beer evaluations and i was just like man this is so cool but in the back of my mind i was like they're probably just doing this because all the sales people are on site and no, mm -hmm. they do that. They do that every week. Like it, it's constant. It's all year round. So for my onboarding, I got to go through a training and, uh, I've got this cool, I've got this cool badge now. It says, Ooh. I smell good. 
Oh, wow. Cause, yeah. Cause I, <laughs> I passed, I passed my sensory test. You got a good sm- uh, sniffer. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> um, and just like the facility tours, I was a long ways into my brewing career before I ever saw what hop harvest looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, people outside of the Pacific Northwest don't, I mean, it's just so novel and I'm from California and we don't have like major hop processing facilities up there. So the magic of harvest is, oh God, I don't even have words. So onboarding was like getting really into the nitty gritty of that stuff and the machines. I mean, obviously there's no hops being processed right now, but, um, you know, just cool stuff. I like industrial landscapes massive pellet dyes, you know, mills. I love looking at mills. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I just started working with the um, hop quality group and have had the privilege to see some of those things that you're talking about. And it's, it's pretty cool to see up close. Oh, yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I don't even know. I'm like, what is proprietary? Like, what should I not? Mention? I know that's what I was yeah. just thinking. Yeah, I know. Like, it's I maybe cool. I go. Things yeah. and stuff, hops and <laughs> smells. <laughs> There's mm-hmm. machines. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to talk about with your experience with pink boots or any, I don't know. I just think you're cool. And I like the way that you think <laughs> and the way that you approach the industry and I love chatting with you. So anything that you want to say about pink boots or anything like that, I would love to hear. On the front of pink boots, I would like to say a lot of the things, a lot of the experience that I have, um, a lot of the experience that's on my resume was not learned from a paying position. It was learned through, uh, volunteer roles that I had taken on, um, almost exclusively through the pink boot society, which is a, I think an underestimated, uh, benefit to, to being a member we don't often get leadership opportunities in, in our roles in breweries. Uh, there are light years more women brewing than when I started, but I don't see that big of a difference in women in leadership roles, which, you know, kind of chaps my hide a little bit, but it's, mm-hmm. it's okay. Our time, our time will come. Uh, so for ladies out there that aren't really sure about membership or maybe current members that aren't really sure about volunteering, sometimes it can be tough. I'm like, I don't want to volunteer. I don't want to mess up. And then, uh, Jen Jordan kind of brought me in to volunteer on the board. And, uh, it was just like, oh, okay. I just like, I do this. And then I write somebody an email and I, you know, and it wasn't that difficult. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. And then I became like a volunteer manager and then, I somehow became a public relations person, (laughs) which was amazing because, um, a lot of what I learned in that role directly, uh, you know, I'm using that knowledge now in my current position. Mm -hmm. So join pink boots. Don't be afraid. I don't really love pink, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, despite the headset that I'm wearing right now, that's pink and has uh, light up, uh, led kitty ears. Yeah, I annoyingly hate, love pink. I almost said hate pink. Uh, I mostly just wear all black, but I just, what a cute color, you know? Yeah, right, I kind right of grew on up brand. with that. Just kind of like, oh no, things that are girly are dumb. Like I totally bought into that. And I'm like, well, Me I too, which like, is why I'm embarrassed that I like it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, there's an, there's an LED hula hoop under my desk. This wall is painted in glitter. I've got um, the headphones that would make six-year-old cat just like die with envy. So happy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sparkles are awesome. They are sweet. Well, thanks for chatting with me about all these kind of all over the place, random things, but, uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah. So I'm sorry that the kitties didn't make another appearance. I was getting ready to take a picture I know. of like Lestat sitting on your head, but yeah, my, I have a hairless cat who was sitting on my shoulder for a minute during the beginning of the conversation. So you guys missed a real good video. Yep. Um, so next week, Kat will be back on the next episode of this show as a host, having a conversation with a brewer of her choosing that will be aired in two weeks, not one week, like I just said. So make sure to <laughs> tune in for that. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media 
And to support journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com slash all about beer. I'm Natalie Baldwin, and thanks for listening to the Brewer to Brewer podcast. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. Discover the advantage of using new and unique ingredients like lemon myrtle or lapsang shushong. First Tea has been working with brewers to introduce distinctive, high-quality botanicals for innovative craft beers. They focus on being direct, flexible, and fast. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com.